In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I remember early in my ordained life hearing an account of a House of Bishops meeting where they were navigating a very difficult decision that was before them. And after significant conversation, some of it a little bit contentious, they were given an assignment. List the reasons for and against what was on the table. A pro and cons list, if you will. Then the second part of the assignment was this. Evaluate each item on the list against a gospel that moves from a place of fear to a place of hope. Are these items on your list fear-based responses or hope-based responses? Now, I realize that many decisions are a fear of this versus a fear of that, or a hope of this versus a hope of that, or that there are times where a healthy fear is wise and born out of a tremendous experience. But often, this litmus test can be effective at rooting out where fear is inhibiting our ability to move toward God. We're just naming our fears, and what is at stake for us. At least as the story was recounted to me, that exercise reframed the conversation, and it led to a remarkable shift. There was a profound honesty in the room that emerged, and eventually even clarity. We are preparing for God with us, where the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Think of the power that fear has over us. I remember that childhood sensation of fear when I was exploring the woods behind my house and feeling lost, like I'd gotten too far away from home, wondering how far it was home, even though it was probably still in a view shed, or at least in shouting distance, but feeling lost and not being able to know my way home. I remember that crippling fear as I got older in middle school of standing out, and how much I wanted to fit in. And that fear got even more profound as I got to high school, and there was the fear of asking a girl out, or more likely not. Assuring myself of the devastating response and then avoiding the inevitable hurt altogether. You know, as we grow up, those fears don't escape us. They change, but they don't escape us, and they still influence us more than they should. We fear pursuing something new or different. We fear the new and different. We fear failure. We fear scarcity. We fear loneliness. We fear for our reputation. We fear what we do not know or understand. We fear for our security, our safety, our health. We fear for ourselves, but even more so, we fear for our families and the myriad of of, of fears that we have and that we carry constantly as parents. We have fears for our nation and we have fears for our world. We can be crippled or even paralyzed by our fears. And we can head down unfortunate and hurtful paths because of our fears. I imagine Joseph was feeling pretty overwhelmed by fear, saturated with his own fears. He was engaged to be married. And in that place and time, engagements or betrothals were a formally binding agreement between families. It was far more like marriage than our engagement season is today. And it could last a while, up to a year if not longer. This was a set time by the groom's family where they were working out all the negotiations of how much of a dowry would be paid to to the bride's family, and that was used to uh, compensate for the fact that the bride wouldn't be there to do all the work that she'd been doing, or uh, if they were generous, uh, to be set aside to take care of that bride if anything were to happen to the groom. In some situations, that was the time uh, where... uh, a child would grow to a marrying age, that this had been arranged with the families before they were old enough uh, to actually enter into marriage. Sometimes it was so that there could be a, an abode created. You know, Often they would live uh, with the groom's family, but there needed to be accommodations made so that there was a place to stay. Uh, it was also a time to prepare for the wedding. Remember Jesus' first miracle, a wedding in Cana of Galilee? 
where he had to transform 120 to 180 gallons of water into wine. Uh, this was a five to seven day festival where you invited the whole community. So you had to save up and prepare for that. So this is all going on while these two are trying to figure out this complicated situation they found themselves in. So while Mary and Joseph weren't technically married, and had yet to consummate their marriage, they were legally bound to each other pretty much just as if they had been married. Can you even begin to imagine the conversation between Mary and Joseph? I mean, the fear that she had to overcome to say yes to God, and then the fear of approaching Joseph to tell him what's taking place. And Joseph's fear and doubt upon hearing I don't think he was convinced of the divine nature of the child growing in Mary. Or even if he was, I don't know that he was up to the task of explaining that to everyone else and raising that child that wasn't his, technically. In a shame culture, there was no easy way out of this for anyone. Joseph must have been beside himself, overcome with fear. What would people think? How much shame would be brought upon this proud family? And they were descendants of David, after all. And he was well aware of what the law had to say about adultery. He was a righteous and faithful man. The law punished adultery, at least for women, with death. He was law-abiding, but he was also compassionate. So he was going to try to go about getting a divorce as quietly as possible, but in a small town, Mary's reputation would have been shot, especially when the child came. And if Joseph stayed, would that child even look anything like Joseph? What does the Son of God look like? But God wasn't done with Joseph. God wouldn't let Joseph stay in that place of profound fear. God sent an angel. Now, one of my favorite things about leading preschool chapel is whenever there's an angel or a messenger of God, and I say to the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, and the five-year-olds, guess what the first thing the angel said was? They all scream back in unison, do not be afraid. <laughs> to Zacharias, to Mary, to Joseph, to us, do not be afraid. One of the most important and one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible. Do not be afraid. Do not be guided by or inhibited by your fear. Take Mary as your wife. Take care of her and this child and name the child Jesus. And he does. And not much is written about Joseph and he is out of the picture, presumably deceased by the time of Jesus' ministry and his death. But what an enormous role he had. And in many ways, he was a symbol of the very incarnation. God with us. Actually becoming dependent on us. And the law and righteousness butting up against mercy and grace. Joseph is thrust into this role and he eventually accepts it. Of not just explaining Mary's pregnancy, but of fathering God with us. So a friend of, me, a friend of mine sent me a cartoon, uh, sent it via text, uh, and it's a picture, and at the top of this edifice is a sign um, that says, uh, Joseph and Sons Fine uh, Carpentry. And then inside, there's Jesus on his knees, uh, finishing a rather asymmetrical chair, which is right beside an equally off-kilter table. Uh, and then you see Joseph standing over in the corner. And as he's nailing that final nail, he tells Joseph that he is sensing a call to ministry. Uh, to which Joseph responds, thank goodness. <laughs> and after due laughter, it did have me sort of considering something I hadn't spent a lot of time considering at least a little more deeply, what was it like to raise a child that was not his own, at least biologically? And I know many have lovingly and devotedly done that before and after him. But raising this particular child, always looking at him and wondering when, how, 
When and how would this child present as the one to meet all of those hopes and fears, to forgive all sins? How do you parent Emmanuel? Dr. Spock hasn't written that book yet. But the critical, and I mean critical part of the story, is that Joseph did it. He, like Mary, said yes. He didn't give in to all of the ifs or what ifs or buts. And the more than ample reason that he had to figure out a way out, to let fear win out, they led or they were led by hope. And so we have this child with whom we can leave our fears and walk in hope. So as we get even closer, what fears do you have in your heart that will meet this Christ child? I encourage you in the days that we have left to name your fears, to acknowledge how they've affected your life, your relationships, your ability to follow Jesus. And then prepare to lay them at the manger so that we may walk from the stable like the shepherds, the wise men, and like Mary and Joseph, filled with the hope and the assurance of knowing that Christ is born and that God is with us. Amen.